Is Leave the World Behind a globalist psyop, race bait, or simply a Julia Roberts best movie of the year? Probably. Especially the latter, since this is Julia Roberts' only film of 2023. And I know that there's a broad swathe of opinion on the film, but the Conspiracy Award goes to the Obamas because of their executive producer status. Earmark this opening, and I'll be right back. Top of the season to everyone. If you enjoy my content, then please hit the like and subscribe buttons. It goes a long way to help the channel. And with no further ado, let's get back to the apocalypse. As the sun rises over the U.S. Sanford start their day, the blue wall with a noticeable diagonal crack establishes the heavy use of color to provoke an emotional response. In the same scene, they hide the number 666, which seems rather deliberately subliminal. Amanda turns to Clay and growls after her humane reflection on society. I f***ing hate people. The Sanfords leave New York City on an impromptu getaway on Long Island. Leave the world behind. Did you fart? They are a boring white nuclear family unit, sleepwalking through life. Clay's well-meaning, but useless. The archetypal, emasculated, modern professional man. He's pleasant and malleable like, well, Clay. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do right now. Amanda, who irrefutably has more testosterone than Clay, is a Karen with a chip on her shoulder. Archie is a listless teenager who may or may not know the reference of his t-shirt. And Rose is a Gen Z girl who wants nothing more than to watch the series finale of Friends because of, you know, priorities. Okay, thank you very much. Rose is probably still affected psychologically from the lockdowns, and that explains her addiction to screen time. As the Sanfords begin to settle into the rental home, they're impressed with its splendorous luxury. Nice crib, G. H. Moving forward, this movie is all about creepy details. The artwork, for example. The black and white abstract painting dominates the wall behind Amanda. There are four white undulations or waveforms, too big and too small, surrounded by black. It's not a stretch that these forms represent two pairs of white adults and children. Black and white tones hardly mix on the canvas. And the relevance of these waveforms will become apparent later on in the film. The color blue is reintroduced in the master bedroom in a painting or photograph of an ocean beginning to churn. The proverbial calm before the storm. Amanda goes into town to pick up provisions. The blue signage of the Point Comfort Market is juxtaposed with her exchanging an uncomfortable stare with Danny, hastily stalking up like a prepper. Later, the family goes to the picture-perfect beach. Blue skies, stratus clouds, sandy dunes. And they park themselves next to an empty lifeguard's chair. Amanda purrs with satisfaction. We practically have the beach to ourselves. While Clay f***s around with the umbrella. He's not particularly handy at things like this. Case in point, earlier that day when Amanda returns from the market, she swats down his clumsy sexual advances. In fact, she seemed repulsed by his suggestion. Anyway, getting back to the beach, the subjective camera emphasizes litter on the sand during Archie and Rose's stroll. Archie ogles a couple of girls in their bikinis. Through the course of the afternoon, an oil tanker on the horizon slowly steams towards them, then grounds itself on the beach. The first undeniable hint that things are starting to go horribly wrong. The registry of the tanker is the White Lion. Is this significant? The starkest fact is that the White Lion was the first slave ship to land in America in 1619. Incidentally, 1619 is also shown briefly on the car radio display during an emergency radio announcement while he stands on the roadside. Also, White Lion symbolizes healing for individuals in the world at large. But that ship sailed a long time ago, and now it's marooned. And strangely enough, Maroon was the name given to slaves who escaped and found their freedom. While on their stupefied ride back to the house, the only words uttered are... There's a Starbucks. That night, Clay and Amanda drink red wine, talk and play Jenga. Clay wears a Bikini Kill t-shirt, a 1990s West Coast feminist punk rock riot girl band. There's no doubting Clay's a soy boy. The consumption of pop culture has left him utterly useless in the milieu of another punk motto, anarchy. And to be honest, what screams useless more than being a professor of media studies? George and his daughter Ruth arrive unannounced, scaring Amanda and Clay. With no other recourse, they ask if they can stay the night in their own house. This is... this is your house? And we cue the race-baiting chum fest. A sudden loud burst blares on the TV. This is an emergency. Clay is convinced and agrees to let them spend the night. And Amanda does not approve. Then the Jenga stack collapses pieces land where they may. Ruth and G.H. retire to the basement guest quarters. As they sleep, the blue emergency screen switches to a CNN alert. 
The US map is blotched with red according to the severity of the cyber attacks. Even more strange is the QR code on the map, right there. If you scan the QR code, it'll take you to the Lake Shaughnessy Abandoned Amusement Park. The link is in the description. The abandoned park is one of the top 10 haunted places in the world, constructed atop a Native American burial site. But what could it mean? America is being reclaimed from its haunting past? Or does it allude to the future state of America, once the world's playground, now is abandoned as a park in Chernobyl? Or is it a rally point? Whichever, I really want to visit this park. Day 2. Rose wakes Amanda, complaining that the internet is still down. Amanda briefly sees news alerts on her phone. The last entry is gibberish, according to Amanda, but it could be written in Cyrillic or Russian characters. Meanwhile, the oceanic painting is more stormy. The waves crest higher above the headboard. Amanda acts like a Karen because of Clay's lack of decisive action. Fine! He attempts to step up and assure her he'll go into town and find some answers. And while Clay is looking for a cell signal, the radio comes to life and briefly announces that cyber attacks in the South are causing havoc with animal migration patterns. Next up, Clay encounters a Mexican lady desperately asking for a lift home in Spanish. She continues to plead for a lift, but the once altruistic man confronts his uncertainty and reacts with blind fear, leaving her in the dust. As he speeds away, he sees the drone confettiing the road with red propaganda leaflets written in Arabic. That's to America. Uh-oh, looks like Cobra's behind this. Rose has the first ominous encounter with the massive herd of deer acting strangely. Are these encounters of wildlife and aggression or a warning? Except for the insect that bites Archie on the ankle, the creatures don't present a clear danger. Ruth and Amanda feebly attempt to ease the tension through learning about each other, but it fails. But going through the motions reveals that Amanda works in advertising and manages professional relationships to sell useless to people. Clay is a professor of English media, as we know. Two useless professions for when society the bed. By the end of the scene, Ruth and Amanda resent each other just a little bit more. G.H. goes to check on his neighbors, the Huxleys, to see if they have any news on the events unfolding. And yes, this is a palpable nod to Aldous Huxley, the famous author whose latter writing pondered and fretted about humanity's inevitable dystopian future. For example, the novel Brave New World. The Huxley residence is trashed. They're nowhere to be found. G.H. walks out to the beach and finds a crashed airliner. Then another one crashes exactly there, like the plane's navigation system has been hacked. Or is this a metaphoric extension that our migratory patterns can be disrupted just like wildlife. If they're equating feral animal survival instincts to our reliance on technology and its inherent danger, then I'll buy that for a dollar. Archie lusts after Ruth as she sunbathes. Meanwhile, Rose forgets about friends for a minute as she's determined to find the deer and convinces Archie to join her. This is when Archie is bitten and that will ultimately be the death of him? Is this the shape of things to come in our fight against nature to carve out our survival? A fight that we will most likely lose? Then the ear-splitting noise changes everything. Archie falls deathly ill. Is this a microwave or psycho-electronic weapon? And if so, who is wielding it? G.H. finally confides what he knows to Amanda from his last conversation he had with a client who has connections with the evil cabal in government and drops the bomb. Especially when the truth is much scarier. What is the truth? No one is in control. No one is pulling the strings. But this feels like a bait and switch to remove the elites or government from the responsibility that the end of society isn't a conspiracy, as they would like us to believe. The most chilling admission from GH is the stages that will be used to topple a country without firing a single shot. The first stage is isolation. Disable their communications and transportation. Make the targets as deaf, dumb, and paralyzed as possible. Setting them up for the second stage. Terrorize them with covert attacks and misinformation. Overwhelm their defense capabilities. Leaving their weapon systems vulnerable to extremists and their own military. Without a clear enemy or motive, people will start turning against each other. It would seem that they want the audience to think that America deserves to be decapitated. And now that things are real, it's time for the Sanfords to look elsewhere, if you know what I mean. GH and Amanda dance, then share a close moment, but then they pump the brakes, and not each other. Meanwhile, Clay and Ruth get high by the pool. Archie is cranking it to the surreptitious photos he snapped of Ruth. Is it fair to say that there exists a reproductive imperative happening here. Mainstream movies since the 1990s have pushed the premise of mixed love and sexual partners. Ruth would be imperative for reproductive reasons, but I think these characters are already doomed when we consider the ambiguous conclusion of the film. Archie definitely isn't going to survive, neither will Clay. This isn't a coincidence. Ruth says this. If the world falls apart, trust should not be dulled out easily to anyone. 
especially white people. I find it irresponsible to drop this line during our time of ramped up racial division. However, Ruth and Amanda find common ground after screaming at the deer as they look for Rose. And Danny eventually sells some meds to Clay. But these small steps forward will probably break down as the nefarious three-stage plan goes into action and society consumes itself. My God. For me, the most horrifying tidbit is the Obama's involvement. Granted, a president isn't privy to all the deep state secrets, but Obama knows a hell of a lot more than the average citizen. And don't forget, Barack Obama revoked habeas corpus, which guarantees Americans' right to a fair and speedy trial by signing the National Defense Authorization Act in 2011. And this means that the state can imprison anyone for any reason indefinitely. And that's a doozy of government overreach since this is a component of the freaking Magna Carta, the great charter of freedoms. In retrospect, Barack Obama's campaign slogan, Hope, was a load of bullshit. And then you couple the prediction from Dr. Evil himself on the topic of cyber attacks. To the frightening scenario of a comprehensive cyber attack. And then there's the recent leaked information that the CIA are now predicting a major black swan event before the next US presidential election, which will result in martial law. As our characters stare into the abyss, at least Rose will be able to watch the finale of Friends in the comfort of the abandoned bunker. The irony of the lyrics for I'll be there for you blends perfectly with his ending. And Rose will be okay for a while. I mean, she is familiar with lockdowns, maybe even comforted by them, and she has an entire library of DVDs to get her through the end. And as for the rest of the characters, God only knows. And the same can be said for us. It's extremely creepy not long after Let the World Behind aired on Netflix that there was a spate of cyber attacks through America on critical infrastructure. It's already happening. But why would the Obamas choose this particular story to executive produce? The film's director and screenwriter, Sam Esmail, reported that Obama gave him notes on his script. I am writing what I think is fiction, and for the most part, I'm trying to keep it as true to life as possible, but I'm exaggerating and dramatizing, as Mel explained. And I hear an ex-president say you're off by a few details, and I thought I was off by a lot. The fact that he said this scared the f*** out of me. Indeed, Sam. Indeed. So what do you think of this film? Are the conspiracies true in your mind, or is it just entertainment? And is it a psyop? Is it race bait? And is it Julia Roberts' best film of 2023? Let me know what you think in the comments section, and please like and subscribe. And all I want to do is provide you guys with high quality content. So thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. Hopefully. You know, can we, can we all get along?